Whitehall Stable is having a breakout year. Hi, I'm Jim Pipple. I'm really excited to share this dream. I put together an expert team that personally picks quality thoroughbreds. We have an exciting roster of two-year-olds this year. It's a great opportunity. Shares are now available. Low risk to you at fair prices. I will manage your investment because it's also mine. Partner with a local name in thoroughbred racing. Join the excitement. Go to whitehallstable.com or call today. This is the OTB Television Network. The field moves into the far turn. It's funny side still holding that lead. The imposing presence of Empire Maker right alongside. They've been one, two throughout. They enter the final half mile together. And now Bailey makes his move with Empire Maker. He is at the front latch of Funny Side. Funny Side and Empire Maker. There's nothing between them. And at the midway point on the far turn, Empire Maker pokes his head in front. Emboldened by that challenge, Funny Side fights right back. And 10 most wanted right there in behind them with Pate as the field turns for home in the Belmont. And it is Empire Maker on the outside. Santos has gone to the whip on Funny Side. Empire Maker a short lead. Funny Side is doing his best, but he's dropping back. And here comes Pat Day. And he's coming with 10 most wanted. Funny Side has dropped back to third. Down to the final 100 yards of the Belmont. Empire Maker Jerry Bailey asking him for everything he has. 10 most wanted right there with him. Here's the wire. And Empire Maker has won the 135th Belmont Stakes. He won it by a neck over 10 most wanted by the back funny side checked in third beaten five lengths well bobby frankel has finally won his triple crown event he has won it with empire maker Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. Along with my colleague, Mike Veach, the racing columnist with the Saratogian, I'm Mark Cassano, welcoming you to this morning's program. And over the next 55 minutes or so, we will be saluting the career of the great Bobby Frankel. And we will welcome in one of his former assistants, local product Chad Brown, to talk about his five and a half years with Bobby. We'll talk about Europe crowning their horse of the year, changes for the Florida Derby and the Sunshine Millions. Then we have 20 of your emails and letters. We will get to as many as possible. And those subject matters should not be any surprise. Rachel Zenyatta, horse of the year, the Breeders' Cup Classic, racing on synthetic, etc., etc. So we will get to as many of those 20 emails and letters as we can. All of that and more if you stay with us for our November 21st edition of the program, which is being brought to you by Jim Pippo's Whitehall Stable. Partner, good morning. Hi, Mark. How are you? Well, good. I'm going to talk about the horse of the year again this morning, Europe's. Europe's horse of the year, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Promise. Just stay tuned. Which was a lead pipe cinch. And it should not have been. We'll talk about that okay. when we get there. Okie dokie. Don't laugh at me. This is, I'm upset about this. Quickly, busy show. Okay. Um, next weekend, Albany Teletheater, Fall Handicapping Challenge. You know, folks, if you like competition, if you like handicapping, I think it's only $20. Go to CapitalOTB.com for more information. But all the prize money, um, all the entry fee money is returned in prizes. And the first two finishers are going to Vegas for the Horse Player World Series. That's awfully good stuff. Doors open early next Saturday at the Teletheater at 10 because first post at Churchill's 1130. First post here at Aqueduct is noon. So go to CapitalOTB.com, please, for more information. One of the most successful trainers in the history of thoroughbred racing has died. 
Bobby Frankel passed away last Monday at his home in Pacific Palisades, California of cancer at the age of 68. The Brooklyn-born Frankel won his first race in New York in 1966 and later scored his first major stake success in the 1970 Suburban. Working with mainly claiming horses early on, Frankel had enormous success. He moved to Southern California in 1972 and immediately upgraded his stock. A winner of 3,654 career races and winning at better than a 21% win percentage, Frankel runners earn nearly $228 million. According to Jay Hovde of the Racing Forum, I did not know this, Jay did the research. Bobby Frankel won at least one grade one race every year from 1988 right through to this year. In 2003, Frankel set a record with an unbelievable 25 grade one victories. He won Eclipse Award as the nation's top trainer five times including four years in a row from 2000 to 2003. Bobby trained 10 champions during his career. Michael, who were those champions? Well, these champions, Mark, in uh, chronological order began with Bertrando, the older male in 1993, owned by 505. And as a four-year-old, Bertrando made nine starts with a 3-3-2 record and sealed his title with consecutive romps in the Pacific Classic and the Woodward, the latter by more than 13 lengths. In 1995, Bobby's possibly perfect, the female turf champion, owned by Blue Vista Stable, won five of six, including the Gamely, the Ramona, and the title clincher, the Beverly D, which I think was her last start that year. In 96, another turf female, Mark Wandesta, owned by Judmont, the daughter of European giant Nashuan tried males twice at 12 furlongs and had a 3-2-1 record from seven starts and won her award in her final start, the matriarch at 10 panels over two high-class runners named Windsharp and Memories of Silver, extremely quick runner when she got in gear. In 97, a second consecutive female turf champion, Rhea Fan, owned by Judmont, began her title season in Europe and swept to three straight grade ones here, including the Yellow Ribbon and the Matriarch. Franco was the trainer on the program only in her last start after which she was retired. 2001 champion sprinter, Squirtle Squirt Mark, owned by David Landsman, concluded his season with wins in the King's Bishop and the Breeders' Cup Sprint, defeating, among others, both Extra Heat and City Zip, 3-3, um, six starts that year. In 2003, another sprinter, Al Debrin, owned by the Flaxman Holdings. Although he failed to fire in the Breeders' Cup Sprint, his fabulous record of grade one wins at Santa Anita, to me this is a championship stuff, Belmont and Saratoga in the San Marcos, Met Mile, and Forgo, respectively, was the kind of campaign voters appreciate. 5-1 record, record from eight starts. 2004, the brilliant, the electric, the sensational ghost zapper, horse of the year and older male, owned by Stronach Stables, only four starts, but so overwhelmingly brilliant from seven to 10 furlongs, he could not be denied. Freakish buyer speed figures in the Island, Tom Fool, and Breeders' Cup Classic, all at 120 or higher. In 2004, Leroy de Sanimo, the champion turf male, owned by TNT Stud in Stonewall, Superior wins in the Kilrow and Addo Mile, now known as the Woodbine Mile, got it done as he won on all kinds of course conditions, a 3-1-0 record from four starts. In 2005, another champion turf female in Intercontinental, owned by Judmont. When you beat Ouija Board and filmmaker in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf, you've done enough, and she did. But she did more in an East-West campaign that included stakes wins at Keeneland, Hollywood, and Del Mar. 5-1-1 from seven starts. Older female champion Ginger Punch in 2007, owned by Stronick, really preferred the eastern tracks and clinched in the Breeders' Cup distaff, pardon me, at Monmouth Park in the slot. Also captured the Gopher Wand at Saratoga and the Ruffian at Belmont Park. Now, if you've got your pens and pencils, you might want to take this down because this is really kind of hard to believe. Mark made an, a, a reference to it a few minutes ago. I did the totals for these 10 champions, 
they made 60 starts. His record for those 60 starts at the championship level was 37 wins, 14 places, five shows. The win percentage is 62%. The in the money is 93%. Bobby Frankel. Grade one starts for these champions were 38 grade ones with 20 victories. I took away two that he didn't have as a trainer of record back with Rhea Fan. A 53% win ratio in grade one company from 93 to 2007, 15 years inclusive. If that doesn't bespeak Bobby Frankel all the way, nothing does. Phenomenal. Bobby was inducted into Racing's Hall of Fame in 1995. He teamed up with Saudi Prince Caleb Abdallah's Judmont Farm, which not only propelled Bobby's career, but it propelled Judmont on a worldwide basis. And most folks thought that Bobby and Prince Caleb Abdallah was, was like Oscar and Felix. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. you know, originally you, you couldn't think of two more diverse men and personalities. <laughs> I've got some personal remembrances of Bobby. As you watch an interview I did with him prior to the Alabama at Saratoga in 2001, Bobby never wanted to draw attention to himself, ever. He always wanted the spotlight on his horses. Now, our associate producer, Julie Hoxie, called him a lot during those years. And he used to say, why would you want me? Well, I told Julie, just tell him if he'd stop winning everything in sight, we'd stop calling him. Now, at times, outwardly gruff and aloof, that's the image, apparently, he wanted to portray. But you know what? Once he sat down for an interview, when he realized you were going to ask reasonably intelligent questions, he would always give you thoughtful answers and would often be found with a shy smile on his face. I really enjoyed interviewing Bobby Frankel a lot. When we did production yesterday, we quickly came across seven interviews with Bobby. Now, we did many more than that, but that's what we found. The thing I didn't remember, all of those interviews were at least 10 minutes long. Once you got him to sit down, he loved talking about his horses. He had first battled cancer and beaten it around the turn of the century. Eventually, it would take his life last Monday. Fellow trainer Julio Canani called him El Presidente. I simply call him a great, great trainer one of the greatest trainers in my mind in the history of the sport uh, has No done. argument and an affirmation. You mentioned the Judmont connection that a fellow like Bob, I love racing because to me, racing's one of the last places where a fellow by sheer hard work can go from the entry level to the pinnacle. And to me, that's what Bobby Frankel's life was all about. And I believe we have a Somebody with us yes, to chat with and, us, and, and we're glad about yeah, that. Yeah, to so. join us this morning is a former assistant to Bobby. In fact, he worked about five and a half years for Bobby as a very young man, and you know him because he's a local product. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us live via telephone from New York, Mr. Chad Brown. Chad, welcome back to Down the Stretch. Thanks for having me again, guys. Hello there, Chad. Hi, Mike. Chad, when you first went to work for him, you were a very, very young man. Was there some trepidation? Was there an intimidation factor? I mean, let's face it, you had heard some stories about Bobby Frankel. Talk to our audience about that. Yeah, I really didn't know what to expect. Um, I met Bobby through a common acquaintance back around 2001, and um, he was in the process of interviewing uh, some people to hire another assistant, which was very rare, because his help stayed with him for so long that he never hired anybody. But he was just starting to expand a bit on the East Coast. He, he knew he needed another person, so I was lucky to get an interview with him. He took me to a Thai restaurant in L.A., and by the end of the meal, he hired me. And I'll tell you, I was nervous about it. But uh, <laughs> I soon found out early on into the job that um, he was just honest, and he, he was thinking a lot. So he didn't mean really to be short with you, but he just he was always worried about his horses. Chad, can you give us an idea from a personal level? Five and a half years, long time to work with somebody. What was Bobby Frankel really like? Um, 
the guy had a big heart. Um, he was um, a fierce competitor. He was very meticulous about his horses being perfect. Um, he he didn't he wanted. He wanted to see every little detail. If they weren't quite right, he didn't want to run them. Uh, he trained them differently. He was uh, he was demanding. Um, if you made a mistake, he could live with it. He just he never made it twice. He wasn't a guy that hollered at you, but he was a guy just with his words. He'd make you feel bad if you missed something, <laughs> without having to yell at you. And um, he, the people around him, you just wanted to try so hard for him because he just had a presence about him where. It was such a high standard, especially when I came in very late uh, in his career. His system was so fine-tuned that it, it just you just didn't make mistakes in it. Chad, I talked to the audience earlier about, you know, when I wanted him to come on for an interview, he never seemed to want to draw attention to himself. He always wanted to talk about his horses. Yeah, he did. And he never made the, the job of training horses sound like it was really hard. As I was learning and trying to pick his brain a little bit, and at different times he'd talk, and other times you just had to watch him. He wouldn't say anything. Um, I'd often say, man, that's, how'd you figure that out, or how'd you do that? And, and more than one occasion, he pulled me up, and he'd say, you know, training horses isn't rocket science. Just use your common sense and watch. He, he never made it sound like he was the smartest, or that you had to be, you know, really, really smart to do this job. He, he only stuck to the basics. And, um, but he had a real feel for the game and, um, and for horses that I've never seen. And I worked for mm. some good people and been around a lot of good horsemen. That's... And uh, Bobby was funny because he wouldn't come in with Wranglers and cowboy boots on. You never saw him on a pony. And, the, and you'd think horsemen, you'd think that, but he was street smart. Yeah. And that guy knew horses, mm. believe me. Chad, in 2007, just before going out on your own, you went to Monmouth Park with champion Ginger Punch and saddled her there. Remind our audience, why wasn't Bobby there? Bobby's dog, Happy, was very, very sick and was permanently ill, and he just didn't want to leave her side. And he, it didn't surprise me at all. I mean, some people were surprised and couldn't believe me. He's not coming because of his dog. And the people that were around him knew that was Bobby, because uh, animals and horses were everything to him. I mean, I'll, I'll share a quick story with you yes. along the same line. One day at Hollywood Park, now we're rolling. This is, this is the year we, we won 25 grade <laughs> one. And we had horses everywhere. I mean, Ghost Zapper was in the second barn. He wasn't even in the first <laughs> barn. That's how many grade one horses we had. And <clears throat> Bobby walked into work one day, and he had the very first barn at Hollywood Park on the right. And he's, he came in the office, and he, he normally sat down, put his glasses on, and was going over the charts, and he didn't go in. And I went up to him, and I said, what's the matter? And he pointed at the road, and there was a cat that had died out in the road. And he said, I can't eat. You know what it was? He said, it was the feed trucks, I bet. They're always zooming in and out of here too fast. I want their phone number. And he was ranting and raving. And then um, we got going, and he went to the track one set, and he came back. And he said, look, and there was another cat next to the cat that had died. And he was, like, looking at it. He said, isn't that so sad? Look at that. He sees that his buddy's dead. Yeah. And he was so bothered by it. Yeah. He got up and he left. <laughs> he went home. <laughs> and I said, Bobby, where are you going? He said, I, I'm too upset. I can't train today. Wow. I said, well, you know, we got Peace Rules breezing and uh, <laughs> the Daglia's breezing after the break. Okay. Said, I'll call him Berto. I got to go. And he left. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, 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 Chad. That's yeah, quite, a, that's that's quite a story, that's, Chad. Chad, you were wow. at his service this past wow. Tuesday. Can you give us a little insight of what it was like, what was discussed, what, what was the general feeling and the mood at, at Bobby's service on Tuesday? Well, it was, uh, it was really fitting for him. I thought that it was perfect. It, it wasn't real flashy. It was just what he would have wanted, something that was just very basic, and it was a beautiful, beautiful day. Uh, couldn't ask for any better weather. And um, you know, it was, a, it was very, very sad. And you know, people were crying. People were laughing, telling stories about him. And um, it was—I um, mean, that's the only way I could really describe it. It was just—it was basic and, and um, it's something he would have uh, wanted, I'm sure. 
Michael has a question for you before we let you go, Chad. Chad, we're really glad you're giving us this time this morning. I do have a question. You kind of touched upon it a few minutes ago, but I'd like you to amplify it, if you will. Bobby was a, a, a kind of a mold setter in terms of the less is more theory, and people really paid attention when Bobby won a race off a long layoff or in Ghost Zapper's races, four, four races for the whole year. But what I'd like to ask you an observation is, did he do this as a program, or did Bobby have this, this sixth innate sense that some trainers have, and the horse comes back from the workout, and Bobby calls an audible? Could you, could you comment on that? Yeah, that's a great question. The biggest thing he taught me about training horses is, is making adjustments. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. There, was in, there was an individual aspect. His system is that there is no system. I, gotcha. I mean, he has a system that's basic care for the horses, yeah. stick to the basics, but within it he individually trained each horse differently yeah. based on what they needed to do. And along with that, he always used to tell me, you know, training horses is making adjustments. He said, and the guy that makes the best adjustments, the problems, wins the most. Yeah. And the conversation came up because it had to do with being honest and, and I would always relay the information to him when he wasn't there yeah. because he, he said, just give me the info. Even if I get mad, I can make adjustments. Yeah. And things happen, like I shared with you guys before. You mean horses breeze too fast, they breeze too slow. A hot walker turns a horse loose and they run down the road. Or yeah. Every day there's human error training these horses. Yeah. And I thought Bobby was the master yeah. at making adjustments. And I don't know if it was he did it for so long, and by the time I came around he had this huge knowledge base to go on, but, uh, yeah. I mean, he, he'd get mad, but then he'd come down after a while, and he'd say, okay, here's what we're going to do, and everyone listened, and we did it, and I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, he was right. <laughs> you, you got it, Chad. <laughs> what, a, what a great answer, yeah. but man, what a skill. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was, um, he called, he called some major, major audibles. Yeah. I mean, I could probably sit here for two hours and tell you, on top of big races, and, yeah. And he knew he was fearless about doing it. That's he good. made it. I mean, he changed his mind a lot now. That was another thing about him. If you ever worked for him, and agents will tell you that, yeah. uh, any vendors that work around blacksmiths, that's, they'll tell you, man, and his name comes up, man, this guy changes his mind a lot. Well, <laughs> that was his thought process. One time he sent a horse out to Farmingdale from Belmont to ship him out on a plane. Yeah. But the horse got there already, and he called up and said, I changed my mind. I don't want, I want to, it was a stake horse. He was going to ship him out west and run him on a turf stake and, or run it down. He didn't know. By the horse already left. I don't care. I changed my mind. We took him off the plane, off the tarmac, and shipped him back to Belmont. And he changed his mind, but he, he'd come to the right conclusion. That was just the way he went about it. And those of us around him realized that that was, that was normal for him. So. Yeah. Wow. Well, when you win 25 grade ones wow. in one calendar year, you're calling a lot of very good audibles. Chad, great job. Thanks so much. We appreciate it uh, giving us some background information on, on Bobby, how it was to work for him. As always, we, we thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Thank you very much. He's, he's a very easy guy to talk about, I'll tell you that. Uh, thank, thank you. Man. Take thank care, you, Chad. Chad. We'll talk Bless. to you soon. Bless you. Take care. Chad Brown, ladies and gentlemen. And... Uh, you know, one of the greats, the all-time greats, is gone. Now, some more news. See the Stars, the brilliant three-year-old who was unbeaten this year and who won a Group 1 race every month in Europe from May through October was named the winner of the Cartier Award as Europe's Horse of the Year. Earlier, I referred to it as a lead pipe cinch, and my partner thinks somebody else should have won the award? Are you, I don't know. Am I competitive? <laughs> Are am, you... I, a, a, am I angry? Am I cynical? Uh, I, I want y'all to think about something, okay? You know where I'm coming from, but I'm going to say it, okay? Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had something called the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships. Fuck. They have named themselves the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships. So I just want you to think about the following thing. See, the stars didn't show up. World Thoroughbred Champion. Didn't show up. Um, somebody named Goldakova did. Goldakova, for the second year in a row, came to the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships from Europe. Not only did she step out of her division, she stepped out of her continent. That's right. 
That's right. And see the stars, winds in a walk. Food for thought yeah. on this morning. <laughs> Carry on. And here I thought that the 58 degree weather earlier in the week had Not affected cold you. Cold enough. <laughs> they announced the Big Sport of Turfdom Award this week and the connections of the great Zenyatta from left to right John Sheriffs, his wife Dottie, Mike Smith, and owners Ann and Jerry Moss were honored with the 2009 Big Sport of Turfdom Award given by the Turf Publicists of, of America. Congratulations to those connections. Great team. Great team. Now, we have news from Magna. The Sunshine Millions, which was run this past January as an eight race series for Florida and Calbreds, will be reduced in 2010. The series, which will be contested on January 30th of next year, will go from eight races to six, with purses being reduced from 3.6 million to 1.8 million as Magna continues their uphill battle with their financial troubles. Mm. And Gulfstream Showcase Race, the Florida Derby, will be moved by a week next year. It will be contested a week earlier on March 20th, meaning that there will be six weeks between the Florida Derby and the Kentucky Derby. Now, since it went to five weeks a few years ago, the Florida Derby was won by mm. future Kentucky Derby winners, Barbaro and Big Brown. Meaning that apparently the move to five weeks was successful. Six weeks is getting into a, I was gonna say gray area, but it's more like black area. If you remember last year, trainer Larry Jones yes, gave Frisian yes, Fire seven weeks. Yeah. And that was no man's land. And he was never the same horse again. Six weeks is on the border of being no man's land because Gulfstream, of course, is, you know, a dirt racetrack. If you race at Gulfstream six weeks before the Kentucky Derby, you can't race again on a dirt racetrack before the Kentucky Derby. Okay. It's a weird, weird change that makes absolutely no sense how, to me. How far is it now from the wood? Uh, the wood is four weeks out, isn't so it? So it would be a two-week yeah, split, you can't which go to the people wood. used to do, right. but they, no way. they wouldn't no even possible think way. of Zero. it now. So. Zero. That was just a question. You know, I got a So bunch of another morning. interesting decision <laughs> by Magna. <laughs> Our friend and colleague Mike Kane, who has held the position of communications officer for the National Museum of Racing since, I believe, 2005, has been let go by that organization. Mike was in charge of, among other things, the Hall of Fame ceremony, the balloting for the Hall of Fame, organizing and presenting the numerous panel discussions and round tables and guests in the galleries, as well as distributing important information to us in the press. I kind of thought something was amiss this past week when I went to the museum website to check on some of Bobby Frankel's statistics and there was no story on Bobby's passing. How could there not be a story on the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame website on one of their own? Well, Mike did his job very well. Sure Apparently, did. those in power at the museum did not realize sure did. that, and we wish Mike the best. All right, we are up to our first break on this November 21st edition of the program. Thank you so very much for having joined us. When Michael and I return, we have 20 count them 20 emails and letters in front of us and we will get to as many as we possibly can before the end of the show as we go to this break gonna look back at Bobby Frankel's only horse of the year in the 2004 Breeders Cup Classic so enjoy the race and Michael and I will be back with part one of your emails and letters right after these messages <laughs> Zephyr comes away alertly on the inside. Free for Internet backs off him, and Azari takes the D inside. It's a big opening for Azari on the inside of Ghost Zephyr, who's guided well off the rail. Roses and May is forwardly placed. Newfoundland is there on the outside. Bias for the first time now, and it's Roses and May, Ghost Zephyr on the outside, Newfoundland, and Azari has been given the rail right up there with the boys. 
and then the Japan's personal rush is fifth and in between Hersey's. Perfect drift on the inside of sixth in the early going. Dine ever four wide seventh and funny side is now back and in between horses running along an eighth. Birdstone down toward the inside then pleasantly perfect followed by Bowman's band and fantastic hat a long way back to a lackadaisical, lackadaisical free for internet. 23 and 2 was the opening quarter there. It's Ghost Zapper in front. Roses and May prompting the pace on the outside. Azari up and down the pace. She's running third toward the inside after a half in a legitimate 47 seconds flat. Newfoundland right up on the pace as well. And then it's personal rushes in between horses racing fifth. Funny side being asked to pick it up early. He's now sixth on the outside. Asper run, four lengths from the front. Birdstone in and among horses. Die never in the clear in the far outside. Perfect drift, rating comfortably six lengths from the front. Defending champion, pleasantly perfect, is seventh. And now called on for run as they round the far turn. Then Bowman's band, fantastic hit. Midway round the far turn. Ghost Zapper now tackled and hit by Roses and May. And they're letting out all stops coming to the top of the stretch. was a well-beaten third. Perfect drift was fourth. This is the OTB Television Network. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. Mike Veach to my left. I'm Mark Asano. We hope you enjoyed looking back at the 2004 Breeders' Cup Classic victory of the Horse of the Year, Go Zapper. Looked a little unusual to see it being run on dirt. And our thanks once again to Chad Brown for having joined us. All right, let's get right to it. We'll get to as many of the 20 as we can. And we, 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 I put these in the order in which they arrive. So we begin with Allen in Saratoga Springs, Mark and Mike. While I am anxiously awaiting the showdown in next week's Breeders' Cup Classic and agree it's potentially a terrific field, I still find it hard to top that amazing 1998 field. Skip away, Silver Charm, Touch Gold, Gentleman, Swain, Victory Gallop, Coronado's Quest, Arch Running Stag, and the winner awesome again. And who could forget that wild finish when they were so strung out at the wire? A really fitting ending. Awesome again, won it by a length over Silver Charm. Swain was third. Victory Gallop fourth. Coronado's Quest fifth. Skip Away, who was the 19 to 10 favorite, was sixth. Touch Gold, who was a sensational racehorse with foot problems, was eighth. And Gentleman, who was terrific in his own right. Terrific when he was on his and, game, ran uh, last. That's how strong the 1998 uh, field was. I, I, I want to thank you. I want to speak on behalf of the Breeders' Cup. The 2009 Breeders' Cup was the strongest one in history. You take my word on that. 
And if you look at that from the head on, you have to appreciate how straight Awesome again ran through that lane. Number two this morning, dear Mark and Mike from Richard of New York City. Zanyata is my favorite horse since last year when I picked her as horse of the year. Good for you. Curlin beat nobody special and was still a tired horse at year's end. In fact, when I got my Santa Anita calendar and saw her picture as Miss October, I've kept the calendar on that month all year. <laughs> okay, Richard. So I will naturally be rooting for her in the classic. And Richard has a postscript here. Perhaps you could let your viewers know about pedigreequery.com. Just as it sounds, it is a nice website for five cross pedigrees. Doesn't give a lot of information, but does give you the names. Richard, thank you very much for taking the time to write. All right, you got another one back And I got back. number three. He's got me in double duty today. Mark and Mike, I just watched the Breeders' Cup Classic when Zenyatta won with ease. All I could say is, wow. I would hope that you and others involved in horse racing would find some way, some neutral site where Zenyatta and Rachel Alexandra could race against each other next year. Our leaders talk about the need for stimulus to help our economy. Such a race could help our economy from the hot dog seller to our companies advertising their wares on such a day. Let's try to make it happen. Jim, a wonderful idea. Thank Jim, you. We, we would love to help, but that's unfortunately impossible. From John in Saratoga, Mark and Mike, the Breeders' Cup just concluded its second year at Santa Anita. This second edition clearly proved how unfair it was for dirt horses. It's very clear that the pro ride surface favors poly and grass runners. One just has to look at how many horses cross-entered, making the field smaller. The results are even more revealing, as once again the dirt horses ran awful. In two years, a dirt horse has not hit the board in a classic. Some classic, there were more defections this year, where dirt horses did not even show up, and can you blame them? Horses that have earned millions, avoiding competition because the surface is stacked against them. Would you want your top-notch racehorse run on, under these conditions? Thank goodness it won't be there again next year because even less would bother to show up. The last two editions of the Breeders' Cup had some great racing with some great inside stories and terrific betting opportunities. And you're absolutely right, John. But calling it the World Championship is a joke when the results are meaningless. Basically, dirt horses have no shot. I think next year's edition of Churchill will prove me right. More dirt horses in dirt races, grass horses in grass races. And I'm guaranteeing that dirt horses will dominate the dirt races after all. Isn't that what it's all about? Dirt and turf, not semi-turf and turf. John, thank you very much. Michael, you got a and couple more. And from Peter, and we thank you for your thoughts, Peter. I find it hard to believe that people can say how clear-cut the horse of the year is. I wrote to you guys last year that Zenyatta should have won the award because she was awesome in winning the Ladies Classic and Curlin got beat. I thought the Woodward was the greatest race ever at Saratoga, but for a female to win the Breeders' Cup Classic was more impressive. It is extremely hard to separate the two horses. I say make them co-horses of the year. Horse racing should be ashamed that no track could get the two horses in a race against each other to settle the debate and leave no doubts. And as for the co-horse of the year, Mark has a comment. Well, again, I said this on last week's show. Um, we've heard not only from the public, but from some people directly involved in racing that they would like to see co-horses of the year. Folks, you have to understand, the way the ballot is presented to us, we can only vote for one of the two. You can't split your vote. So the only way to get co-horses of the year is if they both get the exact same number of votes. That is a remote possibility. Now, there has been some discussion on altering the ballot this year to allow us as voters a choice of either Zenyatta, if you prefer her, either Rachel, if you prefer her, or a co-horse of the year with both of them. I don't think that's going to happen. In, in talking with Tom Law yesterday, the president of the National Turf Riders Association, coming up this Tuesday, the three bodies who participate, the NTRA, the Daily Racing Forum, and the National Turf Riders, are going to have a conference call. And they have to decide on Tuesday if they're going to alter the ballot. The way it looks right now, the Racing Forum is pushing for the opportunity to vote for a cohort yeah, of the year, the, the dual a split option. vote. Yeah. But the NTRA and the National Turf Riders as an organization are not supporting that right now. So Tom Law told me yesterday there's a very slim chance that that could happen. So folks, if it doesn't happen, 
And we're not going to get to all of these today, but this is probably, in all the years I've done this, and since you're substantially older than I am, you've I am. done it longer, <laughs> um, there is more, how do I phrase this? It's almost like there's resentment. If you don't vote for this filly, you're out of your mind. Folks, we know that they're both worthy oh, candidates, wonderful. but we can only vote yeah. for one of them. So while it sounds wonderful, let's make them co-horses of the year, the way the ballot is structured, there is a very slim chance of that happening. All right. All right, moving on. From Peter in Schenectady, Mark, I attended the 1031 Breeders' Cup Seminar at the Racing Museum and was among the handful of attendees who raised their hands in response to Tim Wilkins' question on whether anyone thought that Zenyatta had a chance of being named Horse of the Year. Needless to say, I wonder how many would raise their hands today. Regardless of how the vote ultimately comes out, I want to thank you for making a case for Zenyatta at the seminar and for the confidence and support you expressed for her on Saturday's show. Like me, you've been a true Zenyatta fan since day one. Though her brilliant racing career may be over, and though we may not see the likes of her again, the memory of Zenyatta's greatness will remain in our hearts and our minds for as long as horses run. Peter, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Peter. The one mistake I made about, I don't know, a month, month and a half ago, when I said I thought the horse of the year was basically decided is, I never thought they were going to run Zenyatta in the Classic. They never showed any signs that they would run her against males. Well, I was wrong on that. And what I said at the museum was, if Zenyatta wins the Classic, and she wins it impressively, where people are saying, wow, what a mm -hmm. performance, yeah. she becomes a major threat for horse of the year, and whether or not she wins it, I think I've been proven to be well, correct it's, as far it's as now that a, it's now a point of yes, debate. Yes, absolutely. Yes. From Don, two items. A week ago Tuesday, I talked with Tim Ice, the trainer of Summer Bird, about his fourth in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Tim said he thought his horse ran well, but was quite candid that Summer Bird have would, would have preferred a dirt track. Mm -hmm. Tim went on to say that he was headed home for a few days, but we would be leaving for Japan on November 17th to prepare for the Japan Cup dirt on December 6th. Now, Don also says the announced attendance for Breeders' Cup was 37,000 and change Friday and almost 59,000 on Saturday. This is Don speaking. I admit I am not a professional attendance counter, but I highly doubt that Friday figure, and I've been to Santa Anita before. In my view, the Friday attendance was highly overstated. On Saturday, however, the crowd was shoulder to shoulder, just a huge crowd, and the crowd went crazy for Zenyatta, just as loud as they did for Rachel after the Woodward at Saratoga. Thank you so much, Don. Next up, from John. Dear Mark and Mike, <clears throat> I found very disturbing an article from Bill Dwyer that was recently reprinted in the Pollock Report. The basic gist of the article was that the Breeders' Cup should have a permanent home at Santa Anita. And by the way, Joe Drape of the New York Times also wrote something similar. What was especially disturbing was his following commentary on Greg Avioli's position on the matter. What isn't well known is that Avioli says he is more than open to making Santa Anita the permanent home of the Breeders' Cup. Now, there's a commitment to Churchill next year in what Avioli calls some soft commitments for a year or so after that. This position by Avioli is not something I have heard before, and it disturbs me greatly if it is true. We did not contact Greg, but he has stated here in the past that, you know, he likes Santa Anita very, very much. I had found out through a third party that during one of the Breeders' Cup Board of Directors meetings that there were a number of people in favor of making Santa Anita mm. the permanent home of the Breeders' Cup. Fortunately, there were a few more who at the time didn't want to make it the permanent home. Thank you very much, John. All right, we're up to our final break on this morning's November 21st edition of the program. Thank you so much for having joined us. When Michael and I return, we will get to as many more of your emails as possible. Going to this break, earlier you saw a piece of video on an interview I did with Bobby Frankel back in 2001, Alabama Week at Saratoga. Well, Bobby was represented in the 2001 Alabama by flute. So we'll take a look at that year's Alabama going to the break. And Michael and I will be back with more of your emails and letters right after these messages. 
They're in the gate. And they're off. And exogenous breaks best. Tweed side down toward the inside. Dance through the dawn is up close early, and so too is flute. As they move by us for the first time, flute. Flute and dance through the dawn. Head to head in the early stages here of this Alabama. Two and a half lengths back, and Tweed side will come from off the pace, running along in third. Two item limit is fourth and on the outside. Then exogenous and unrestrained. Real cozy is the last of them all as Flute takes the field along here. A solid pace established by her. A 23 and three opening quarter mile. Dance to the Dawn is two and a half lengths behind her. Then it's a break of another four to two item limit. Down toward the inside is Tweed side running along in fourth. Then unrestrained, exogenous, real cozy is still allowed to trail the field in the early stages here. A 47 and one opening half mile by Flute running a hard race here while setting the pace. She's clear by two lengths. Pat Day and Dance to the Dawn, they're not far behind as they approach the half mile pole. Then Tweed side two item limit and exogenous, unrestrained, real cozy is only six lengths from the front. Flute has run three quarters of a mile in 111 and one. The Queen's Plate winner, Dance Through the Dawn, has been second throughout. And now Pat Day is asking her for more run. Flute still going strong. Tweed side toward the inside. Here comes Exogenous. Real cozy. Real cozy is charging hard, but she'll be fanned six wide as the field turns for home in the Alabama. And Flute is still there, driving on the lead by three lengths. Exogenous driving hard in the second. She appeared to brush with Dance Through the Dawn, real cozy in two item limit, and they are all chasing Flute, and she's got a five length lead at the 16th pole. Exogenous is a leg weary second, two item limit on the outside, and Flute has won the Alabama. She has won it wire to wire in dazzling style. This is the OTB Television Network. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. Mike Veach to my left. I'm Mark Asano. We've got 11 emails and letters to go. We'll get to as many as we can and the rest for next week. And for number nine, here's and one And here from we Ann. go from Ann. Uh, thank you, Ann. Dear Mark and, Mark, as I eat, Mark and Mike, as I eat my new steady diet of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches due to my visit to San Anita season. Yada, bless you for that. I must say it was worth the sacrifice. I have chased Triple Crown since Silver Charm's attempt and always disappointed in the outcome or felt a jinx. For once, I was not disappointed. This mare is something to see in the flesh. I've never seen anything like her in my life, and I'm no spring chicken. Her presence in the paddock is the warm-up to the grace and elegance she shows on the track. She puffs herself and gives us all a show with that unusual walk of hers. Then came the race. She balked a little loading, which worried me terribly. Was she afraid of the Colts, or was it just not her day? Then came the crazy quality road incident, then the back out, then the crazy start she had in the flipping of her head, besides the hopeless distance she was facing to her counterparts, I think you mean uh, allowing her counterparts. Words cannot express my deep concern and worry. Finally, she pulled herself together and finished a race in 23 and won. She wasn't wet 20 plus times, she wasn't leg weary, she didn't show any signs of distress after the race. 
Instead, she continued to puff herself up and prove to the world she deserves Horse of the Year. She beat the same horses as Rachel in one race, besides other classic winners from the East, West, and Europe. Bulls Bay, one of the Woodward runners Rachel beat, was nowhere in his race. And you can't say he didn't like synthetics. All you need to do is see his record. Life is Sweet won the Ladies Classic the day before, and she was third in the Hollywood Gold Cup, and yes, that was against Colts. Zenyatta beat her as well. The horses that Zenyatta beat out west left and went east and destroyed the field. See Tough Tiz's Sis 118 buyer for the one and a mile 16th Ruffian Handicap at Belmont, reading off the fractions ending in 140 and two fifths. Zenyatta raced and beat her every chance they had. Zenyatta's record was even better in 2008 against Curlin's, and that has nothing to do with 2009, yet no one batted an eyelash on a tie or giving it to Zenyatta. Fact is, Rachel could never go the mile and a quarter distance, and the nonsense of synthetics is that nonsense. Rachel won at Keeneland, and if you look over the races for the day, the Keeneland horses did very well. Mr. Jackson chose not to show up for the Breeders' Cup. Would football teams, and a horse is not a football team, to not to choose to show up for the title games because of artificial turf versus dirt? Would baseball teams choose to stop playing in the summer because they were ahead in their division? The voters need to stop wearing blinders and vote correctly. I'm not partial to any one of these two girls. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not blinded by, by the facts. <laughs> Thank you for the subtlety. <laughs> The first female to win two Breeders' Cup divisions, the first female to win the Breeders' Cup Classic, the first to receive the highest buyer number on synthetics, beating a classic field at the classic distance. If Zenyatta's not chosen, then the voters are the ones that lose. Not Zenyatta. She'll be a winner to those of us without the blindfolds and the prejudice of the East and West Coast rivalry. Again, that's Anne from Queensbury. And I thank you for your passion very, very much. Good letter. There was an awful lot of passion in there, Anne. I'm going to say it again. We can only vote for one of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're both extremely worthy. You know, if we don't happen to vote for the one you like, it's not because we're wearing blinders. There's nobody who picked up on Zenyatta earlier than we did on this show. We love her. I absolutely love her. From Ken, talking about Zenyatta's success in the Breeders' Cup Classic, he said there were three keys to Zenyatta's success. When she began her run around the turn, a diagonal channel opened up. When she entered it, the other horses just scattered, kind of like pigeons when a car passes by. Her move in that channel was a perfect inside-out slingshot that you see all the time in auto racing. No wasted energy or motion. Had there been one of more horses in her path, then she would have had to check her swerve or run over them. That magic channel enabled her to get her favorite spot on the track, similar to a basketball player going to his favorite spot on the court. My lasting impression of the cup was how unfair it was to dirt runners. No wins out of 16 dirt races. <clears throat> uh, Ken said the last two years. The record is far worse than that for the last two years. Summer Bird, Music Note, Pyro, Careless Jewel, all nowhere. Um, finally, we were king of dirt racing. No way, no how would a bunch of European turf horses consistently beat us on dirt, but it changes on the poly. Never more, says Ken. Ken, thank you very much. Michael, you got a couple? And a short one from Bob. Uh, Mark and Mike, I realize you have a full show this weekend, but a question regarding the ownership of Vale of York. The owner's listed as Godolphin Racing Lessee. I was wondering how the Lessee part of the ownership works. If you wish to have someone else manage your horse for maybe something like leaving Europe, they will, assume, uh, they will assume care and responsibility. I do not know what splits on purses were made, but the first person retains ownership after the lease agreement expires. I don't know where it'll go next year. They say he's coming for the Derby. We'll see how that works out. Thoughtful question. From Peter, Mike, and Mark, I just want to thank you for your insight, encyclopedic knowledge, and passion for this wonderful sport. I remember standing with my father and grandfather in the grandstands of Saratoga in the early 60s, being encouraged to cheer on a horse as they flew by the top of the stretch. My reply was, they can't hear me. I like that kind of thinking. I was six at the time and remember the wonderful moment like it was yesterday. Anyway, still at 53, I know no more about handicapping than I did at my first trip, but love the sport no less. I did hit a 10,000 plus super in the race following the 2000 Alabama though, good for you. I truly was jumping for joy at Zenyatta's performance and felt tears of joy afterwards, so did I. 
after the mayor's glorious performance and her daunting beauty. Like a lot of people, I jumped on the Zenyatta Horse of the Year bandwagon right away. But here's my point. After hearing Mike's rationale for Rachel, I've tempered my opinion that the award belongs strictly to Zenyatta. I did watch Rachel at Saratoga and was similarly overjoyed with her victory. I feel you've both brought me to view the debate about Horse of the Year in more broad terms, and I really enjoy your vast knowledge of the sport and the sport's history. I was able to see Secretary at Saratoga and would have to say it is still the most exciting horse ever. Anyway, thanks again for educating me and entertaining me as well. With regards, Peter Ford, we appreciate it, Peter. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Peter. From Greg, my vote is for Rachel. Mike Veach has got me convinced, though I think Zenyatta is probably the better horse at distances over a mile in a 16th. Thank you, Greg. And from Eulis Hotkins, Gentlemen, as Zenyatta bent to the left and began her grind, I felt a chill up my spine and the hair rise on my arm. There is only one other who gave me the same thrill in my 40 years as a race fan, and Mark knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> I, can I guess? Yeah. His two-year-old races at Saratoga Preakness at three left me breathless, and such did, and such did Zenyatta. There have been tons of great racing duels, but on a singular note, these two left my senses spent. Yes, there was personal Lenson as well as John Henry, the slew, or spectacular bit at four, good pick there, and so on. And as to Rachel Alexander versus Zenyatta, my money always goes with the adage, a very good older horse beats a very good three-year-old, as Forgo did. Zenyatta has deceptive speed. I agree with you there. She'd cruise by Rachel in the stretch. Happy holidays from Yuldis. Thank you Thanks, for taking guys. the time. That's all we have time all for. Righty. We got through 14. We will do the remainder next week as well as any others which are sent. Here's how you can get to us through the United States Postal Service down the stretch, Mark and Mike. Um, <laughs> uh, Smith Street, Schenectady, 12305, or electronically. There we go. Thank you for saving me. 510 Smith, Schenectady, 12305 or electronically at viewer mail at capitalotb.com. So we'll read the rest next week, and we will get to any new ones. Time to thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air. Pete Persico directed. Pat Peretta and Pat did a great job on this week's open, saluting Bobby Frankel. And Kurt Flick and Dan Hayes, our associate producer, Julie Hoxie. And special thanks to this morning's guest, Chad Brown, who did such a great job on giving you some background information you, Chad. on the late, great Bobby Frankel. Have a great Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Same Have a great to you. One. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you so very much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. We appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend and a terrific upcoming week, including a happy Thanksgiving. And from all of us here at Down the Stretch, we'll see you next week. Whitehall Stable is having a breakout year. Hi, I'm Jim Pippel. I'm really excited to share this dream. I put together an expert team that personally picks quality thoroughbreds. We have an exciting roster of two-year-olds this year. It's a great opportunity. Shares are now available. Low risk to you at fair prices. I will manage your investment because it's also mine. Partner with a local name in thoroughbred racing. Join the excitement. Go to whitehallstable.com or call today.